and I will hand over to Eureka, our ALAW student ambassador from Queens Uni Belfast, to introduce our session for today. Thank you, Tiffany. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming today for the ALAW seminar with Four Balls UK. I am the ALAW student ambassador, Eureka. First, I would like to give a warm welcome to Four Balls and today's guest speaker, Emily Wilson from the Four Ball UK office. Before we begin, we would like to give a brief introduction to Four Balls and today's guest speaker, Emily. Four Ball is a global animal welfare organization that works worldwide. We are thrilled to host the ADO seminar with Emily to discuss how we can live kinder for animals. Emily works for the campaign team at Four Balls UK. Emily is specialized in diverse areas concerned with animal rights, such as farming, wildlife and companion animals. She has worked for over a decade in conservation and animal welfare, protecting animals both in the UK and worldwide. Today's seminar will mainly cover six topics. First, we'll begin with animal rights, animal welfare, concerned with transporting animals. To be more precise, how can we take responsibility for animals throughout the course of transporting or traveling animals from one place to another? Second, the seminar will cover the dog and meat trade in Southeast Asia. Third, we'll think about how we can promote meat reduction and food procurement to help farmed animals. Fourth, we'll discuss what does it mean to be a responsible pet owner and closely look at the legal puppy trade. Fifth, we'll consider the use of animals in the fashion industries. And finally, we'll briefly go through the impact of global pandemics on animal welfare in relation to the spread of zoonotic disease. If there are any questions, please do not hesitate to ask, do let us know, do feel free to pop into Q&A so that we can answer your questions in the end. Thank you for listening to my brief introduction. Now I would like to pass on to today's guest speaker, Emily. Thank you, Yuriko. I'll just share my screen. So thank you for having me today. Um, it's fantastic to have been invited by ALAW to come and talk about the work that we're doing here at Four Paws. Um, the presentation I want to give to you today is about our Live Kinder campaign. Uh, this actually acts as a kind of umbrella campaign into a lot of the work that we do across all the different um, areas that Eurico listed just then. Um, I have done things in a slightly different order, changing last minute, but uh, I will be covering all of those topics and a little bit more. Um, I actually head up the, the campaigns team in the UK, which is about three people only. Uh, it is a smaller team compared to our European offices, but uh, we are small but mighty and we try and do uh, a hell of a lot of work uh, that we possibly can in the country. So I want to talk to you today about how we can all live kinder and how you guys might in your personal lives or your professional lives help support some of the work that we are doing. So a little bit about who we are first. Um, Eureka gave a great intro, but as she said, we're a global animal welfare organization. We were originally set up in Austria and are absolutely huge in Germany and Austria and Switzerland. And the countries such as Australia, the US and the UK are actually newer markets that um, we've only been open for about 15 years in the UK. And yes, starting to, to really grow and, and thrive here. Um, our overall vision for our charity is a world where humans treat animals with respect, empathy and understanding. Our whole remit is about those animals impacted by direct human influence. So we don't work on conservation issues and about animals in the wild, but we do work with wild animals that are directly influenced by humans, such as those that are either taken from the wild to be pets, uh, traded or used um, in other variety of ways. Um, where we are, as I said, we're mainly a sort of central European charity, but we have spread very far and very wide. And now we have uh, offices all around the world, including um, Southeast Asia, Australia, South Africa and the US, as well as Europe. And we also have a number of charity, uh, 
charity sanctuaries as well. So as well as these offices that we have, we also have about a dozen charity uh, sanctuaries around the country, uh, around the world. Um, many of which are bear sanctuaries, uh, several of which are big cat sanctuaries. So we have tigers and lions there. We have an orangutan sanctuary and we also have um, some uh, dog and uh, population management centres where we try and do rehoming of stray animals, um, mostly in Eastern Europe and Southeast Asia. So our top priorities, um, as you can nicely covered, is uh, wild animals in trade wild animals in entertainment and textiles so that's things like circuses but also um, the fur industry for example uh, companion animals so basically pets uh, farm animals and then global issues which cover basically almost all of these areas so pandemics and animal welfare we feel is directly connected to farm animals but also wildlife and companion animals and climate change, again, which can be arguably connected to all of the, uh, the trade of, of animals, but also the way that we keep farm animals. So the first topic I want to talk to you to about today is spinning the agenda around is actually pandemics. It's the most uh, topical conversation at the moment. And as now we're even seeing new variants arrive, um, it, that conversation is not going to go anywhere <laughs> anytime soon. This is still very prevalent. Uh, the main feature I wanted to uh, focus on first is about ending the um, commercial wildlife trade. So what we mean by the commercial wildlife trade is animals that are commercially traded in order to make profit. So this is probably for exotic pet trade. It could be mink here in this picture for the fur farm trade. It could be for traditional medicine and things like this. Um, we're not talking about wildlife trade in terms of animals um, being moved around uh, for rescuing and sanctuaries, but very much for commercial purposes. And we believe, you know, at the end of the day, that animal welfare and the way that we have treated animals is what has resulted in the COVID-19 pandemic that we see today. Uh, our campaign uh, sub sub claim that we use is when they suffer, we suffer. The way that we farm these animals, the way that we treat them, the way that we uh, keep them in captivity is so um, conducive to allow viruses to spread. Animals are constantly under stress. They're in inappropriate conditions. They get weakened immune systems and they basically allow these diseases to jump from animal to animal and eventually evolve into a, a, a zoonotic disease, which means it can jump to humans. We know that mink especially have uh, caught and spread COVID-19 pandemic across multiple uh, fur farms and many of which have had to be um, killed or the fur farms closed entirely. So it's, it's, not, um, it's not new news that animals are able to give us diseases, but the way that we are evolving as uh, humans and the way that we are putting pressures on animals is making the situation a lot worse. And for us, we, we believe that it isn't a matter of if the next pandemic happens, it's just a matter of when. So our absolute demands for the pandemics and animal welfare campaign that we do is that we need to end these high risk practices. So this is the commercial wildlife trade, these uh, wet markets that you heard about in the news. It's ending fur farming, which is these you know, very, very poor condition state of farming. Uh, the dog and cat meat trade that is uh, often overlooked, but actually, it, you know, if you ate a, a piece of dog meat that had rabies, that dog had rabies, you could catch rabies from that meat. It's a very real and, and possible problem for locals in those countries. And factory farming, there are many uh, pandemic and zoonotic diseases that have come from factory farming, such as bird flu and sw uh, swine flu, and they have affected humans and killed hundreds of thousands worldwide. So it's a, it's a very possible uh, problem that we still need to to resolve. The commercial wildlife trade, as I mentioned, is fueled by our demand for animals, whether it be for pets, traditional medicine or even entertainment, such as things like elephant riding or cub petting. Um, at the moment, the UK is actually one of the worst for importing uh, protected wild animals and their parts. Um, we're actually the number one importer of tiger parts in Europe through one of our investigations. So even though it doesn't seem very obvious here, we are actually responsible for a lot of the issues going on around the world. 
And it's our responsibility to do something here, whether it be an import ban of certain species, whether we have positive pet lists where we only allow certain species to be pets, and whether or not we um, strengthen or the enforcement of, of wildlife crime uh, offences. One of the big topics we are focusing on at the moment is trophy hunting imports. And you may have seen some news uh, coverage just this week, actually, where we are expecting some mysterious statement from government. But essentially, we are looking to see a total ban on the import and export of hunting trophies so that the UK once and for all stops facilitating this horrible practice, which essentially is a blood sport. It is done for the pleasure of hunting an animal for fun and it is drastically having impacts on the animals in the wild, not to mention the fact that it is just an extremely cruel and horrible way to, to treat animals. If we can uh, ban the import into the UK, we can um, basically help curb the interest on this issue, make a stance, a global stance that we are against this kind of animal cruelty, and hopefully other countries will soon follow. At the moment, uh, we are waiting the government's announcement on this, and they have promised to address um, trophy hunting ban. Boris Johnson has been quoted himself to say that he wants to see an end to this brutality. So we really do hope that the government keeps its manifesto commitment and we see a trophy hunting import ban. So moving on to the dog and cat meat trade, which I've mentioned briefly, this topic is obviously extremely tragic. Several other charities are working on this area and you would have heard of uh, the Yulin Festival in China or these dog and cat meat farms in, in, North, um, in South Korea. But unfortunately, uh, it's starting to grow in Southeast Asia. And when I say Southeast Asia, I mean Vietnam, Cambodia and um, Indonesia. And these countries, it hasn't been around as long. And it was one of those things that's actually evolved more from poverty rather than cultural reasons. And uh, unfortunately, we're seeing numbers starting to increase, not to the levels that we see in China and Korea, but definitely to levels that are, uh, you know, frankly, unacceptable. And we do think there's an opportunity to end this before it gets any bigger. The trade does pose huge human health risks to people and zoonotic spread of things like rabies. And there's obviously many, many charities and governments that are working to try and curb rabies in these countries. And the dog and cat meat trade only undermines all that work that has been done by taking away vaccinated animals for the trade or spreading animals around the country who have not been vaccinated yet. These animals uh, obviously go through an incredibly unpleasant uh, situation. They're taken uh, often from communities and loving families. They're often uh, stolen pets. Then they're taken to slaughterhouses and markets and brutally killed in, in a variety of ways, which I will not get into today, but uh, are basically a very short lived and unpleasant life for these animals. So we are working with governments in Southeast Asia to ban these. And we have made some fantastic program, uh, progress so far, such as Siam Reap, which has recently become dog meat free. And we're also hoping to have an announcement on Friday this week. So keep your eyes on the news. We have successfully closed a few slaughterhouses. Um, obviously, this is completely uh, what ad hoc and, and one at a time job and couldn't possibly do this across the entire Southeast Asia, but we're doing as many as we can. And it's not just about shutting these places down, but it's working with those owners to transition into sustainable livelihoods. So some people we've helped set up their own shop or rice paddy fields and basically have been extremely grateful to us to get them out of this industry, which they never liked in the first place. Uh, we've also been able to rescue many animals as a result of this. Um, and we've been able to get them adopted in their new forever homes in different countries around the world, as well as in Southeast Asia itself. So it's fantastic to see so many cases where these animals have gone on to live long and happy lives. The story of which uh, Gerbil the cat just recently, um, excuse the graphic image, but she was found uh, just left on, uh, he was found, sorry, on the, the picture on the left and the picture on the right is where he is today in his happy, loving home. Um, he's actually going to be coming to the UK. So he is doing really, really well and um, absolutely a, a softy all in all. So a bit about travel there, a bit about um, places all the way around the world. It actually evolved into our animal friendly travel campaign because we were talking to the tourism industry about the dog and cat meat trade and how they could help be on our side and help promote 
the need for governments to end that trade. So we ended up producing a campaign called Travel Kind. And that was all about giving travel companies advice about how to be animal friendly. This covered a variety of wildlife advice, but also about how to engage with community animals, looking out for donkeys that may be malnourished or not cared for adequately, but also thinking about what you eat on your plate. You know, people are very tempted to do the cultural tradition, but you know, if you're worried about the welfare of animals or if it might be something uh, illegally traded for wildlife or dog and cat meat, then just avoid it altogether and you can do your bit while you're on holiday. So we have this guide and I can send this around to you guys after the talk today, but it's some really good tips there, 12 top tips on how to travel kind. So completely moving away now from wildlife and around the world and talking about what we're doing here at home. So one of the big campaigns we're trying to end here in the UK and across Europe is the illegal puppy trade. So unfortunately, you may have seen in the news that since the beginning of the pandemic, there has been an incredibly large scale increase in the number of puppies being purchased online. Numbers have jumped up uh, hundreds of percent into the thousands for a pet. And, you know, dodgy and unscrupulous breeders are really taking advantage of unsuspecting families by putting prices up, by rearing puppies in poor, quick conditions where they're not vaccinated, they're not given the adequate care, and they're also taken away from mum far too early. This means that many families are end up welcoming a dog to their home and the dog soon dies or gets very, very ill uh, as soon as they've joined the family. This costs the family you know, hundreds, maybe thousands of pounds in vet bills, but also heartbreak because they've lost this brand new fluffy companion and they managed to only get a few days of, of love with that animal. So it's a real, real issue. It's getting out of control. And even recent stats from the Dogs Trust have said that they expect around 40,000 animals to be uh, abandoned by the end of this year, these pandemic puppies. People are already going back to work. They haven't got time anymore. They haven't got the ability to look after them anymore. And these animals are being abandoned like an old pair of shoes. And it is such a, such a shame to see. So we are uh, doing an entire education awareness campaign. It's very important to try and raise awareness. You know, if you're thinking about getting a pet, we always recommend adopting. But if you are going to buy it, we try to provide as much advice as possible about how to spot dodgy adverts, whether that be adverts where you see multiple breeds from the same person, adverts where you see uh, you, they don't allow you to see the mum, uh, or they want to arrange a, a drop off so that you can't actually see where the, where the puppy has come from. It might be something like pick up the dog in a car park or you've tried to contact them and you have six different phone numbers for them in the end. All of these things are things you can look out for that indicate really suspicious behaviour. We also have an online reporting form for victims, so we're hoping to work much more closely with prosecution and investigation agencies so we can take these reports from victims who have gone through this uh, unfortunate occurrence and hopefully try and prosecute uh, breeders who don't have licenses but are selling puppies and also breeders that have not provided adequate care to these animals and they have died very quickly uh, in the care of their new family. So if you do know anyone and you do have ever heard of any of these stories, please send them to our online reporting form because we can hopefully help any victims of the trade. Our model solution for this is a, a big um, idea we hope to, to end the trade. And it's called the model solution is basically calling for full traceability of the online trade of puppies. So the biggest issue we have is that puppies are sold on third party websites, such as things like Pets for Homes, Gumtree and Facebook. And at the moment, you can advertise anything you like and there is no restrictions there. You may already be aware that there is mandatory registration and microchipping of dogs in the UK from the age of eight weeks old. And what we are proposing as the model solution is that in by registering your dog immediately from birth to your name with a microchip, you then transfer the owner to the next owner so that there's full traceability for the full life of the dog. And if you say you give up that dog and it goes to a shelter and it goes to the next owner, it eventually stays with the owner. Uh, it, it changes name on the registration all the way to the death of the animal. And that way you have the full journey of that animal on record on a database. 
This would also be fantastic if those third party selling sites would use this database in order to allow advertising. So you couldn't advertise and sell your dog until you had your registration number in your advert. This means that if someone purchases a puppy and it dies shortly after breeding, you can trace that breeder because they have registered themselves on the database and they haven't been allowed to advertise without doing that. And therefore that person can be held accountable when that puppy dies. Because what's very common is that people are unable to contact their breeder or reach them ever again after this situation has happened because they are dodgy breeders. So we are calling for the model solution. We are halfway there. We have Lucy's law now. We have mandatory registration, but we need to connect that to advertising and selling, which is where the biggest issue is. So we're also doing this at European level with the animal health law and also uh, Europetnet, which is the biggest European database. So we've just seen this implemented in um, Ireland, which is a, a scheme called PetSafe, and we're hoping to see it in Switzerland soon and then even hopefully in the UK eventually. So this leads me nicely onto responsible pet ownership, where, as I said, we've seen an increase of calls um, from people uh, looking to give up their animals. But also what people have failed to realise is that pets have had to adjust to a completely new pattern since we have uh, gone into the lockdowns. Um, cats, uh, dogs are extremely happy to have us there. Cats have actually found it quite stressful because they are used to a certain level of independence and we are there all day long. Many cats, are, for example, have been reported not to be getting as much sleep as normal and having more stress behaviours. Dogs have become extremely uh, dependent on us. They're used to having us there almost 24 seven. And when people have started to go back to the office, a lot of anxiety patterns have started to come out in these animals. And it's also small mammals as well. So there's a lot that we can be doing to try and alleviate the stress in these changes of patterns with our animals, but also making the effort to provide them with enrichment, to prevent boredom, to prevent anxiety when we separate from them. So we have lots of tips and tricks on our website about what you can do to help uh, help your animal at home and be a responsible pet owner, but also to give you education of whether or not you really are ready to be a pet owner, because it's not a short term thing. It's a lifelong commitment. And uh, we have a um, 30 day test so that you can imagine 30 days with your pet and see if you think you can uh, be a, a responsible pet owner for 30 days and then you know you're ready. Um, so for the next section, a completely different uh, topic, which is animal friendly fashion. This is something I'm really excited about, especially this week, because just on Monday we launched our brand new uh, fashion report and have had some fantastic media coverage so far. Wear It Kind is all about talking to the fashion industry about having animal welfare policies. A lot of the products that we wear from wool to uh, down feather filled uh, insulative coats or duvets to um, knitted socks, cashmere cardigan, uh, mohair gloves, all of these things involve animal products. And in some cases, um, there are responsible alternatives. There are plant based alternatives. And then in cases with things like exotic leather and fur, we feel that there is absolutely no alternative. You just say no. So it's all about working with the industry to improve their uh, fashion standards and show more compassion in fashion. So focusing on fur, we have a big campaign. We work with several other charities on this um, to basically call for a fur free Britain. Even though we banned fur farming um, in 2002 in the UK and therefore haven't uh, been legally allowed to, fur, to farm mink or any animal like that since that time, we are still importing millions of pounds worth of fur each year. So where is it all going? We've got animals like foxes, mink, raccoon and chinchilla still being uh, used as accessories on coats, um, little fur baubles on the top of a hat. And houses like um, uh, stores like House of Fraser or Harrods are still making a big profit from fur products in their stores. So we've been campaigning some of these brands such as here in this picture of House of Horrors, um, House of Fraser, who actually were fur free for 10 years and have now gone back on that ban since um, Mike Ashley took over and have now decided that it is not important to them anymore. So we're working hard to try and convince them to bring that fur ban back. 
Um, but also because eventually we actually want to see an import ban introduced by government because it is a small part of the market and there is no reason that we could not end this trade once and for all. Exotic leather is a similar one. This is what we mean when it comes from uh, animal skin. So the majority of animals used for this, as you can see from the graph, is crocodiles and alligators. But they are still used a lot today for handbags, watch straps, that kind of thing. And even things like ostrich, you might think, what on earth do we use from an ostrich? But the bobbly skin is actually what makes up a certain very expensive handbags and um, is really well sought after. These animals are generally farmed in very, very poor conditions and don't have a very good quality of life. So at Four Paws, we are absolutely against any form of exotic leather and fur farming because there is simply no sustainable or responsible way of doing this. Down feathers. So this is a topic that we've been campaigning on for many years. And actually what down feathers are used for, people don't quite realize, but it's for the stuffing of coats, very insulating coats, um, duvets, uh, pillows, that kind of thing. The very fluffy, lovely feathers that you find. When we say that, we think, oh, you know, feathers grow back. Feathers are something that, you know, what's the big deal? But actually, the most irresponsible way of getting it, which is the majority still at the moment, is live plucking. So these animals have it torn from their skin um, and the left, as this picture indicates there on the side. It's very, very unpleasant. It's very, very cruel. And it's also directly linked to the foie gras industry because these same birds are the, the ones being force fed for um, the size of their liver in order to use for foie gras. So we have been campaigning against uh, down feathers. There are plant based alternatives, but there's actually a certification scheme that fashion brands can sign up to nowadays called the Responsible Down Standard. And this commitment promises that no birds in these farms that are certified by this standard, uh, none of them do live plucking and none of them do force feeding. So if a company like um, Marks and Spencers, for example, have decided to use this uh, certification scheme, it means that they can promise never to do any of these things. And that is a really good um, progress that we like to see. So we'll promote brands, we will promote these certification schemes, but we're also working with the fashion industry to build these certification schemes to make sure they're just, they're not just greenwashing, they're not just a label, they actually mean something and it's being audited and checked on a regular basis. And the next topic is fine wools. So this is what I was talking about with mohair, with angora, alpaca, and also merino wool. So you've probably all heard of, of one or two of these before, um, but unfortunately they're all taken in unpleasant ways. And generally a fine wool is associated with cruelty in some way. Um, mohair is taken from angora goats. If you've seen them, they kind of have uh, like dreadlocked goats, very long, long ringlet hair. And those goats are generally not treated uh, well or don't have the, the, the adequate housing that you would expect. Angora, you might remember from the media, has a um, very bad reputation because this is these fluffy rabbits. And similar to the live plucking, the, the, the fur is actually torn from them while they're still alive. So very unpleasant. Um, alpaca wool. It's uh, interesting. People won't maybe see an issue with alpaca wool because they're just sheared like sheep. But basically, alpaca are quite a skittish animal and they're just not very well um, used to being farmed. And uh, it's just not in their nature to be sort of kept in pens and things like that. So they are generally uh, all in all very difficult to farm in a well way. And then we have merino wool. And merino wool is our biggest focus at the moment. This is from mules lamb. And if you don't know the word mulesing, this is basically a, a practice predominantly done uh, in Australia. So 90% of merino wool comes from Australia. And these sheep are very wrinkly sheep. They have lots of folds in their skin. And what you unfortunately get in Australia because of the weather conditions is flies will climb into the folds of those skins and lay eggs and, and cause um, infection. So what farmers have decided to do is mules the sheep, which is basically to cut these folds off of their skin with no anaesthetic, no painkillers, and uh, you know, leaving them with very, very sore, open wounds on, the, on their bottoms. So we have been working with the industry to phase out mulesing. And this has come up with our wall with the butt campaign because we want to see lambs with their butts left completely alone. So 
Um, at the moment, millions of animals are enduring this process and farmers have seen it as the only way to prevent this condition called fly strike, where the flies um, will lay eggs in the folds of the skin. But we've discovered through working with the industry that if you can breed uh, the sheep to have smoother skin and you know select for the animals to breed that have uh, fewer folds, eventually you will eliminate the need to do mulesing ever again. The quality of the merino wool changes not at all and therefore there's absolutely no reason. It, it will take some time before you've completely eliminated folded skin in the, in the breed, but it will be possible. And because of that, we now have the responsible wall standard, much like the responsible down standard, which assures that animals have not gone undergone mulesing on that farm. And we're really pleased to see several British brands sign up to the responsible wall standard. We also have, um, we did an initiative just recently called the uh, Brands Letter of Intent, where brands will basically sign up and commit to phasing out merino wool. And we had brands like Primark, Misguided, um, and M&S all sign up to those to that letter, which was fantastic to see. Um, if you want to read more about these four topics that I've touched on very briefly today, we have produced our pretend fashion magazine that we called Faux Paws. Um, and these are on our website, so we'll make sure you see this presentation afterwards and you can go find them. But they are basically everything you need to know about these topics and what you can do at home to, to prevent uh, helping these industries thrive. And uh, almost the final topic today is our climate and farming work. So a big topic we're trying to get into now, which is climate change. And it's hard to immediately see the links to animal welfare in that situation. But generally, the way that we farm animals is becoming increasingly more factory farm style, more industrialized, which means cage keeping of animals, um, lots of more close confinement, sheer numbers involved is, is got out of control. These big industrial farms are what are causing a, a lot of greenhouse gas emissions. So at the moment, we can say up to 18% of global greenhouse gases come from animal agriculture alone. That's more than every plane, ship and car combined in the travel industry. So this is a really big problem. It wasn't properly addressed at COP26 this year, and we were very disappointed about that. But something that we are really pushing for is promoting a diet change and not climate change. So promoting meat reduction, meat-free Mondays. We're not about um, vegan messaging at, at Four Paws, but we are about less and better meat. So we are all calling on the public to live kinder and we implore everyone listening today to take that pledge to reduce the meat consumption in your daily life. We are also working on our Make Food Kinder campaign, which is specifically working with local authorities across England to, to also commit to less and better. So uh, committing to meat reduction in their food policies to address climate change, but for the animal products that are still being consumed, choose the better and higher welfare options that are available and at the very least support things like free range eggs in your diet. Local authorities are responsible for schools, libraries, care homes, hospitals, prisons and essentially you could be making a choice in your family at home that you want to eat responsibly but you send your child to school and they're given the worst quality food and certainly not high welfare. So basically taxpayer money is paying for animal cruelty. So if you want to have a choice and a decision on that, you can help influence your local authority. And we'll be doing a lot of action next year around this, um, working with councils further. You can go on our map online now and see where your council has scored in our ranking. Um, I expect you will see a lot of red uh, for, for your councils, as you can see on this map. But do go and have a look. And um, you know, if you have uh, any questions about it, you can reach out to us. But I would always implore you to talk to your council directly as well. Council elections are happening in May. And if you are interested in voting and looking into who your local councillors are, you can ask them to start thinking about this and prioritising it. So finally, we need your help. We need you to help us live kinder. We have multiple petitions ongoing at the moment, which would be great if you could sign and help support our work. But we've also got this Live Kinder guide, so we can send this to you as a PDF or you can uh, get a printed version in the post. But essentially, this guide will give you the top line tips of what I've run through today and what you can do. But you can also share this with friends and family and help spread the word. 
We'd be great if you could follow us on our social media channels and help raise awareness of the animal welfare issues that we raise on a day to day basis. But all in all, we can't do it without supporters. We are where we are today because of the help and donation from supporters, but also they help us to take action and put pressure on decision makers, whether it be in uh, politicians or whether it be industry. And without those supporters, we've not been able to achieve the change that we have today. So thank you for listening. I will end the presentation now and I welcome any questions from the audience. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, you're absolutely right. It might be a small team, but you do so, so much and um, definitely touch on everything. <laughs> it seems right across the board, a little bit of everything. Um, so if anyone has any questions, please pop into the Q&A. I have lots of questions, so I can go ahead and, and ask you one while we wait for everyone to gather their thoughts. Um, so just as a first question, um, I think I was really surprised to see about tiger parts coming into the UK. Um, I'm curious about what parts specifically are used and what they're used for, if this is something that you're, you're able to share with us. That's a great question. Um, one thing that we have noticed, so uh, what we really noted the pattern of the number of imports that we were getting into the UK and then the number of exports we were then sending away. It really identified the UK as some sort of manipulator of parts into something that would then make someone a profit. So we seem to be this kind of middleman for the trade. Um, a lot, a few of them were trophies, so you know, full animals or skins or the heads, for example. Like a, people find that decorative in some barbaric way, but many of the parts were bone, um, nails, uh, claws, skin, that kind of thing, which is used pred predominantly in traditional medicine. So these parts can go uh, very, very pricey. They can be used um, and purchased around the world by many people, and yeah, we can make a huge profit for people. Um, the problem with these, these animals specifically, we have this report called second class tigers, which I recommend you read. And that essentially what we deem by these second class tigers is there are these tigers that are bred. They are bred across Europe. So we have uh, legislation called CITES, which is the control of trade and endangered species. But that, that only protects tigers in the wild. It does not protect the thousands and thousands of tigers that are bred in captivity and spread often only to be killed for their parts. So these tigers are in circuses, they're in shows, they're pets in people's houses, or they're bred for their parts, and they have no protection other than basic animal welfare protection, which often goes unenforced. So our report, Second Class Tigers, was pointing about how it's really helping to drive the illegal trade, even though it's the commercial and actual legal trade because they don't have this protection. Interesting. Wow. Um, the more you learn. Yeah. Um, we have a question here for you from Greta. Um, what is your view regarding education in the exotic pet trade? I know that awareness education campaigns are often overplayed, but it seems like many of the people buying these animals as pets think of them, sorry, think of themselves as animal lovers and also are unaware of cruelty involved in the process. Yes, um, it is something that the, the, the charity is looking to start uh, getting into. At the moment, we've had a, a campaign specifically around primate keeping in the UK. Um, and that, that issue is being addressed at the moment by a government who have committed to a primate uh, ban. They are trying to water it down into a licensing agreement, which we do not think is strong enough. So we're pushing for a full on uh, primate ban. But obviously that is one specific species. Um, that's a very good point that prime, uh, you know, people who have exotic pets tend to be animal lovers, they respect animals, they want the animal in their life and it's obviously extremely tempting to be able to have that uh, with you whether it's for companionship or simply ad admiration, um, but you're correct, many animals are sourced uh, from the wild and or farmed in conditions that are not suitable to them. It is very difficult to keep some animals uh, happy and alive in your home and we see huge numbers uh, being abandoned and released into the wild. RSPCA seems countless um, records from uh, pythons to geckos to lizards all being abandoned because they simply get too big or they just become too expensive to look after and people can't keep them happy. 
many cases of animals being released into the wild, thinking that an animal in the wild will just survive, forgetting that the UK is cold and rainy and probably not where it was reared originally. So they don't go on to live a happy life at all. Although I would argue things like terrapins seem to have overly thrived and now become quite an invasive species. Um, they ended up bursting as a population around the 90s when the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles TV show came out and everyone wanted a pet terrapin. And now we see uh, thousands and thousands of terrapins across the country really affecting fish populations, wildlife populations in that way. So it is a big problem. It is something that needs to be addressed. And one thing I'm very interested in on, on a professional level is um, these positive lists that we're seeing across Europe where you could identify certain species that would be uh, less terrible to have. They are the species that are OK in our care. They are species that are reared maybe appropriately and are able to have a, a better quality of life. And therefore, you would immediately eliminate lots of high risk species, ones that could become invasive, ones that would suffer. And therefore, it's a compromise that is much more amenable because it is extremely difficult to try and end these trades 100 percent. And until we get to that point, compromises have to be made along the way. So that's something I'm personally very interested in. Thank you, Emily. Such a comprehensive answer. Thank you. Um, another question from Elizabeth. Um, she says, quite a broad question, but I was wondering, um, sorry, I was wondering what your thoughts are on the UK's animal welfare laws. There's so many bills in, po sorry, in progress um, that it feels like we're in a great period of change, but perhaps not quick enough. Um, is there anything you'd like to see more of in the UK um, under animal protection laws? Fantastic question, Elizabeth. Yes, this is actually something me and my boss uh, were joking about the other day that I have never seen so many, uh, so much progress happening so recently that you feel like, am I really needed as a campaigner now? You know, have we <laughs> have we done so much that we don't need to do anymore? But of course, the answer is always yes. Um, traditionally, uh, animal welfare is always associated with the Labour Party since they brought in like fox hunting a decade or so ago. Fur farming was up to them. Um, and obviously the Green Party will always be animal welfare friendly. And it was always quite an assumption that no one else cared. But actually, we see a lot of MPs, regardless of their party, showing a huge interest in animals. And um, Sir David Armes, who sadly passed recently, was a huge advocate for that in the Conservative Party and as a backbencher had huge influence on many legislations that were going through. At the moment, um, we have some straightforward commitments from government around legislation around live exports, the ban on primates, the trophy hunting ban and some illegal puppy trade related uh, restrictions, um, which is all great to see. For us, that is brilliant. We like those, but we just don't want to see any loopholes, any gaps, any bits and bobs that are tweaked that it helps the industry carry on as normal. Because when we see the fox hunting ban, for example, it has not quite delivered on what it was meant to do. And we still see trail hunting happening today under the gut, well, fox hunting happening today under the guise of trail hunting. So that is why we have to close those loopholes. The trophy hunting ban has been mentioned that it would be endangered species only. There are many species that are only considered vulnerable, but including lions, which means they wouldn't be protected by that law, which would be terrible. The primates one I mentioned, they're talking about a licensing policy instead of a straight up ban. So that isn't good enough. Licensing is so difficult to enforce. Local authorities are stretched enough as it is. So we wouldn't want to see that either. So there's still a lot of work for us to do to make sure those things go through properly. And then in terms of the new stuff, um, we're hoping that we, the government needs to focus more on the food strategy and climate change. That has not been addressed and was not adequately addressed at COP. So for us, that will be an absolute focus, as well as pandemic prevention. If we improve the way, if we can eliminate factory farming, if we can improve the way that we treat animals in different farming situations, we can help eliminate the risk of uh, pandemics. So I think a lot more to be done in climate and pandemics and tightening up what, we, what is going through at the moment, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I and I, I do see every day it's, you know, a, a law in France, a law in Spain, Canada. So it does seem to be um, quite a global thing. So it's yeah. sometimes I wonder, am I just in a bubble in my animal law bubble? And actually, when I step outside, it 
you know, there's not that much happening, but um, yeah, it definitely feels like people are starting to care more, um, definitely more aware of everything that's kind of happening. And I think we're much more conscious consumers of everything, aren't we? Um, Absolutely. And we've especially seen that from lockdown, people's conscious behavior around like textiles, what people are buying, you know, uh, pre-loved clothes instead of just going for fast fashion. People's habits are changing all the time. There's more plant-based meals than you've ever seen before. It's not just the third option at the end, which no really chooses and you always go for the first two it's 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 more completely accepted now and enjoyable and not you know round down your throat as you have to do this or you're evil you know it's really completely easy and and nice to do and you don't feel any guilt or shame (laughs) yeah most definitely I go to places now and it's like would you like the vegan menu and I'm like menu (laughs) (laughs) just choosing the one option you have Uh, so it's wonderful and of course as well the recent development um I'll I'll bet it's not gone through um legislation or not passed yet sorry but the decapod crustacean development so um, that's really fantastic that it's likely that we'll we'll see the sentience bill passed and have um, decapod crustaceans and cephalopod I probably pronounced that wrong mollusks mollusks <laughs> um, seen as sentient so that's fantastic um, yeah I have another question for you um, about the dog and cat mate trade um, mm-hmm. you know obviously animals you know <laughs> my cat is a stray and having seen what he's been through and how he's quickly adapted in my house has been fantastic but I wonder what it's like for the the cats and dogs that have been in you know the far the cat and dog meat trade how do they do um do they adapt well in home situations or um yeah what what are you seeing when you're having these animals adopted into homes Yeah, that is a great question. So we work with partners on the ground who have shelters. So we're not immediately transferring them to new homes and families, but they're kept in these shelters sometimes for several months until they have uh, developed a trust of humans, a basic trust of us because they have been abused, terrified, treated uh, poorly. But they also need to socialize with each other. They might be community animals that have become quite quite feral or uh, maybe aggressive. So they need to calm down. But all in all, they've basically gone what we call like a therapy treatment they have gone through a time where they are uh, you know eased into life eased into human care and respect and eased into good adequate food and, and husbandry and after a period of time when they have also cleared you know absolute quarantine they haven't got any kind of rabies or anything like this we're able to do um lovely trade uh, uh, with another country where we're able to import you know to trade them over um, by airplane and uh, only last year we had uh, 12 dogs go over to the US and as I said we've got a few coming over to the UK um, but essentially yeah go on to live wonderful lives I've never uh, we've not had a bad story yet everyone's gone on to go and have a new home the most top priority is we want um, them to stay in the country that they're in because it's really good to try and encourage this pet behavior it's very standard in western countries that we have pets that we see dogs and cats as pets but in other countries they can be seen as pests or a hassle or, or a danger to your children or anything like this so you know it is a growing trend now to have pets in southeast asia and we want to promote that and we want to ideally reunite these victims of the trade with the family victims who lost their pet a few weeks ago because they didn't feel that they could approach that van with the scary men who took the dog and you know if we can try and reunite them even better so that is a big program that we are doing uh, in Indonesia at the moment through the dog meat free Indonesia campaign. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. That's fantastic to hear. I always wonder because obviously a lot of them have been in these tiny cages for quite some time and you just wonder if they get aggressive and um, yeah, how they react to being back with humans. But um, thank you. That's wonderful to share with us. Um, Eureka, I I apologize. I've been talking a ton. Did you want to ask any questions to Emily? Um, I think Tiffany have covered the most important questions that so I'm I'm from my end. Thank you. That's all right. Thank you so much. Um, we don't have any other questions for you, Emily, but I would love if you could send across um, the, the tourism guide you mentioned that you had um, and we can share with with our members. That would be fantastic. And um, just a big thank you on behalf of Ayla. Um, it's been wonderful to have you to learn about um, all the different projects you're doing. And I look forward to the update on Friday, I believe you said. 
<laughs> it'll be a lovely dog hopefully some wonderful dog and cat meat trade news so yeah fingers crossed another another city in southeast asia is going to go dog meat free we hope <laughs> oh, wonderful we we hope as well and we look forward to hearing about it um yeah thank you so much and um this webinar will be available on our youtube so we can share far and wide and um, get all these important messages out to lots of different audiences I'll hand over Brilliant. to you, Eureka, um, if you want to say a few words before we close out as well. Thank you, Tiffany. Thank you very much for joining our webinar today. If there are any questions, as Tiffany has mentioned, please reach us to for Pauls or Adol. We could, we will be very keen to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Bye-bye. Brilliant. Thank you for having me. Bye. Bye.